Well, welcome to this lecture. My name is Jeff Chamberlain. I'm a professor of neurology at the University of Washington. And I'm gonna to talk to you today about the development of gene therapies for the muscular dystrophies. So let's start off with an introduction. As, as you probably already know from other lectures, the muscular dystrophies are, represent a wide variety of different genetic disorders. So these are inherited disorders, and there's many different types of muscular dystrophy, each one caused by a mutation in a different gene. A difficulty in trying to diagnose muscular dystrophy is that many of the different versions of this disease are not distinguishable at a clinical level. So it's important to go in and do the genetics and try to identify which gene is mutated in an individual patient in order to have a clear picture of exactly which type of muscular dystrophy that individual has. The characteristic of all the different muscular dystrophies is that there's a progressive and ongoing weakness of muscle tissue. The major tissue that's affected in all the muscular dystrophies is the skeletal muscle, the limb muscles, and all the major structural muscles of the body. But many forms of muscular dystrophy also affect cardiac muscle. The heart is a muscle as well, as well as different types of smooth muscle throughout the body. Some forms of muscular dystrophy, particularly the congenital muscular dystrophies, can also have involvement of the central nervous system that can lead to developmental delay and other CNS problems. Different muscular dystrophies uh, have different characteristics as well that allow one to try to distinguish them. There's a lot of differences in the age of onset. Some muscular dystrophies come on at birth, some don't appear until early childhood, some appear as a young adult, and some also appear in older individuals. The different forms of muscular dystrophy can also differentially affect different muscles. Some dystrophies start around the pelvic region, some will start around the shoulders, and there's not always a common picture of which muscles are affected in different types of muscular dystrophy. So this is a little cartoon that uh, illustrates a major complex of proteins found in muscle tissue. You've probably seen this before in the course, but many of the proteins involved in this complex are defective in different types of muscular dystrophy. So we've heard about the dystrophin protein, which is shown in blue on the slide here. Uh, dystrophin is a critical protein that helps to nucleate the assembly of this large complex of integral and peripheral me membrane proteins within muscle cells. The dystrophin protein binds to many of these other proteins directly, such as actin, and at the carboxy-terminal portion of the protein, it interacts with many of the transmembrane proteins. An interesting feature about this complex of proteins is that mutations in the genes that encode these different proteins often lead to different types of muscular dystrophy. So mutations in the dystrophin gene can cause Duchenne or Becker muscular dystrophies. Mutations in the sarcoglycan genes cause different forms of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And mutations in at least 15 different genes that are responsible for processing the protein's dystroglycan can also cause different forms of congenital or limb girdle muscular dystrophies. So this particular protein complex is responsible for the majority of the different muscular dystrophies, although not all of them. So we're going to focus on Duchenne muscular dystrophy as we have elsewhere in this course. And let me tell you a little bit about Duchenne muscular dystrophy. As I mentioned in the previous slide, this disease is caused by mutations in the dystrophin gene, which is an enormous gene at 2.2 million base pairs. Typical Duchenne patients don't produce any of the dystrophin protein, so that's what we call null alleles. Uh, their mutations are unable to make a functional protein. However, some patients uh, have a mutation that leads to production of a smaller protein or a partially functional protein, and that typically leads to a milder disease that's known as Becker muscular dystrophy. And the identification of some of these mutations in the Becker patients that are responsible for producing smaller dystrophins has led to the concept of developing smaller versions of dystrophin that potentially could be very useful in therapeutic development. In general, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is characterized by progressive muscle wasting, and the muscle tissue is gradually replaced by connective tissue or fibrosis, as well as fat cell accumulation. Typically, patients will succumb to either respiratory or cardiac failure, and with increasing uh, medical care, uh, many of the patients are now living until their mid-20s, sometimes into their 30s. Patients with a milder Becker muscular dystrophy have a slower age of onset, a slower progression of the disease, and they typically have a longer lifespan. And an advantage of studying Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophies is that there's a variety of animal models 
for this disease that can be used for a variety of different studies. So back to the dystrophin gene. This is the largest gene that has been identified so far in nature, and it's thought that the enormous size of this gene is responsible for the frequency of the disease. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is one of the most commonly in, common inherited human disorders, and the large gene has a lot of targets for things that can go wrong with it. So there's a very high spontaneous new mutation rate in this gene. And one of the things that that means is that not everyone that has the disease has an inherited the defective gene from their parents. Sometimes there's a new mutation that, that arises uh, uh, in the family that causes the disease to arise for the first time. The gene is divided into many different exons, and there's a variety of promoters or gene regulatory elements that control production of a variety of different forms of dystrophin. The largest form of dystrophin is found in all different types of muscles, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, skeletal muscle, as well as some neurons in the central nervous system. But some of the promoters make shorter forms of dystrophin that are found in a lot of non-muscle tissues. But all of these different proteins that come off this very complex gene are referred to as dystrophin proteins. So dystrophin itself is illustrated in this cartoon here. And one of the interesting characteristics of the dystrophin protein is that it binds to many other proteins. And in doing so, it helps to localize those proteins to the proper place in muscle cells, which is just adjacent to the sarcolemma membrane in, in the muscle cells. So in particular, at each end of the dystrophin molecule, <coughs> we have uh, an actin binding domain and then a beta dystroglycan binding domain as well as binding domains for other proteins that are part of the dystrophin complex known as dystrobrevin and syntrophin. The central part of the dystrophin protein is a very large rod-like domain that confers flexibility and elasticity on the dystrophin molecule. And that's thought to be important because muscle cells are known for contracting, doing work, getting larger and smaller. And this dystrophin protein plays an important role in tethering the internal cytoskeleton of muscle fibers to the extracellular matrix, and it needs to be flexible and elastic to withstand these tremendous forces of contraction within the muscle cells. So what I want to talk to you about now is the development of genetic therapies for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. There's a number of different approaches being pursued in a variety of laboratories to try to find ways to restore production of the missing dystrophin protein that's responsible for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. One of the methods that's being used and is a particular focus of research in my own laboratory is to try to harness viral vectors as a way to deliver new genes into muscle. And this is a form of gene therapy. Gene therapy can be applied in a lot of different ways to try to replace dystrophin production in muscle cells. The, the simplest way you can imagine is to replace the dystrophin gene itself, bring in a new copy of the dystrophin gene to take over for the mutant version. Another approach would be to deliver another gene that may be similar to dystrophin or one that can substitute for the normal function of dystrophin. And an example of that is a gene known as eutrophin. Uh, eutrophin is a gene that's very similar in structure to the dystrophin gene. They evolved together over many millions of years, and it's been shown that the eutrophin protein can substitute for the dystrophin protein. So that may be an alternative if obstacles to dystrophin replacement were found. Another approach is to trick the cell into ignoring a mutation. So the problem with Duchenne muscular dystrophy is you have a mutation in the dystrophin gene, and that can prevent production of either a normal messenger RNA or a normal protein. And if you can get the cellular machinery to skip over or ignore a mutation, you can still produce a protein that would be very functional but may not be quite as large as the full protein. And one way to do that is through a technique known as antisense oligonucleotide delivery, which induces exon skipping. So you can cause the, again, the cellular RNA machinery to jump right over a uh, mutation that affects the normal splicing of a gene into messenger RNA. Another approach uh, involves stem cell transplantation. Uh, there's a lot being known, being developed these days about uh, muscle stem cells and what it takes to grow new muscle. And if you could harness the stem cell technology to bring in a muscle stem cell that had a fixed or a normal dystrophin gene, you might be able to fix the disorder that way. So I'm going to focus largely on methods to restore production of dystrophin through genetic therapies uh, based on gene in a, genes in a variety of ways. 
So at the top of this slide is an illustration, again, of the dystrophin gene, and there are two major strategies that are targeted right on this dystrophin gene. One, which is a newer therapy, involves gene editing to try to go in and directly fix the mutation that's responsible for the disorder. The second approach, which at this point seems a little easier to do, is a gene introduction therapy, more of a classic gene therapy, trying to bring in a new or an alternative version of the dystrophin gene to take over for the mutant gene. Second approach that I was referring to in the previous slide is an exon skipping therapy. This is an approach that's focused on the production of the messenger RNA from a mutant gene. And again, the idea is to fix the messenger RNA so that it no longer contains a deleterious mutation. A third approach is being developed that is targeted for a very specific type of mutation. Some of the mutations that lead to Duchenne muscular dystrophy and many other diseases are caused by single changes in a nucleotide sequence that creates a premature stop codon. So in other words, rather than encoding a series of amino acids, sometimes you can have a mutation where you get a stop codon telling the protein production machinery within a cell to stop doing what it was doing, and that pre prevents the formation of a functional protein, and there are drugs being developed that can cause the cell to ignore some of these premature stop codons. And then a fourth approach that's being pursued is to purify a normal dystrophin protein in the laboratory, or perhaps a smaller mini dystrophin, as I referred to earlier, and take large amounts of those proteins and directly give it back to the patients through a intravenous delivery system in order to provide this missing protein. So let's think a little bit about the types of mutations in the dystrophin gene and why that leads to an inability to produce this important dystrophin protein. Normally, genes are, of course, divided into exons and introns, and the cellular machinery reads through the gene sequence and converts that into a messenger RNA where the different exons of a gene are spliced together onto an RNA template. That RNA is then copied into protein by the ribosomes in the cell. So normally you have a, a, a gene that has its exons and its introns that encodes for a normal protein, and the gene can produce that protein in the proper amounts to do its function. However, on the right-hand side of this diagram, you'll notice I have a red X across one of these exons within the gene, and this represents a mutation. And if you have a mutation that blocks normal production of the messenger, messenger RNA that comes off of this gene, that can lead to production of a messenger RNA that's not able to encode the normal protein, and that will typically cause a partially functional protein to be made or a, a protein that's not the normal size. And in the case of dystrophin, proteins that are not the full size in, in terms of having both ends of the protein, and I'll come back to this a little more later, uh, those proteins are typically not functional and they're not stable, so they're very difficult to detect within a cell. They're usually not uh, visible by immunoblot methods of analysis. So let's look at this in a different way. This is another representation of dystrophin and the dystrophin-associated protein complex. And again, as, as we've heard elsewhere in the course, dystrophin is an important protein linking the actin cytoskeleton to the extracellular matrix. In order to carry out this function, dystrophin needs its critical protein-protein binding domains that we talked about earlier in this lecture. So the amino terminus of the dystrophin protein which is uh, shown uh, on, on the <clears throat> right-hand side of the diagram, interacts with the actin cytoskeleton, but the, but the parts of the dystrophin protein that are important to link up to the extracellular matrix are completely down at the other side of the molecule, near the CT region that's designated here, which stands for the carboxy terminal domain of dystrophin. If there are mutations in the gene that prevent production of this full-length protein, such as represented by this X, you may have a gene that makes a messenger RNA that encodes most of the protein, but if it doesn't make the part of the protein towards the carboxy terminus that is necessary to assemble this transmembrane complex to link up to the extracellular matrix, then you have a non-functional protein 
it's rapidly degraded within muscle cells, it's not detected by immunoblot, and that will lead to Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So are there things that we can do uh, about these mutations to fix the disease? And that's, again, where gene therapy comes in. And uh, many laboratories are now very active in the development of gene therapy for both Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophies. The goal, one of the goals of, of this process is to replace the defective gene. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are, there are different ways to achieve genetic therapies for this disorder, but one of the more promising and perhaps one of the simpler ways to do that is simply to replace the defective gene, to bring in a new synthetic version of the gene. And it, there's many advantages and disadvantages of this type of approach. One of the advantages is that it should fix the cause of the disease in, in pretty much any patient and that is the lack of dystrophin. These patients do not make dystrophin, they get Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy. If you can bring in a new copy of the gene, produce the dystrophin, that should rescue the disorder regardless of what the underlying genetic mutation is. Now, that's something that is obviously easier said than done. There's many challenges. I mentioned earlier that dystrophin is needed in all of the muscles of the body. So you need to have a way to deliver a new dystrophin gene throughout the body to all the important muscles. And you need to do that in a way that the, does not activate the body's immune system, leading to rejection of whatever uh, therapeutic delivery vehicle you may be using. The good news is that this is a technique that is gene therapy in general is starting to work for many other disorders. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've heard of a lot of progress with diseases such as X-linked SCID, which stands for Severe Combined Immunodeficiency Syndrome. Uh, more than 50 patients have been essentially cured of this disease through a gene therapy approach. There's been very promising results with a number of patients that have uh, hemophilia B, the most common bleeding disorder. Uh, there are several forms of uh, inherited blindness that have been uh, significantly improved through a gene therapy approach. And there's a new, newer approach that has been recently applied to a disease known as lipoprotein lipase deficiency, and the drug there, which is based on a gene delivery vehicle known as Glybera, has recently been approved for sale in Europe. And this is the first example of a commercially approved gene therapy drug uh, that has been approved in the Western world, and that's now available in Europe. So let's focus specifically on Duchenne muscular dystrophy. One of the challenges of trying to do gene therapy for muscular dystrophy is that you need to deliver the dystrophin gene to all the muscles of the body. So how do you do that? The method we refer to when we talk about trying to transfer genes all over the body, we call that a systemic gene delivery method. And how, how can you actually deliver a gene into muscles uh, all, over the bottle, uh, all over the body? You need a shuttle vehicle, as we call it, uh, almost like a bus if you think about it, that can transport your new gene to the places where it's needed within muscle cells. We, we refer to that as a vector. And the best vectors these days are ones that are derived from viruses. So they're not actually viruses that we're planned to use in the clinic, but it is a gene delivery vehicle that is made from a virus. And the way you do that is you remove the genetic elements of the virus and replace those with a synthetic version of the dystrophin gene. And the idea here is that you take the remnants of the virus, uh, which still retains the information for transport through the body and entering uh, cells. You're taking advantage of the natural infectious pathways of these viruses, uh, but they will go into different cells and they drop off their payload. But in this case, they're not dropping off the viral genes that work to make you sick. Instead, they're dropping off a new version of the dystrophin gene, which is designed to make you well. So, so far, there's a variety of shuttle vectors derived from different viruses that are showing promise for gene delivery. The ones that seem to be working best for muscle gene delivery are derived from a virus known as adeno-associated virus. One of the limitations of these AAV viruses is they're very small viruses, so the delivery shuttles we produce from them cannot hold the enormous dystrophin gene, which, if you recall, is the largest known gene so far, and that's prompted us to try to develop smaller and smaller versions of the dystrophin gene so that they will retain the ability to encode a functional protein and can be delivered by this gene delivery shuttle. So here's an example of how some of that work proceeded. This is a series of cartoons that illustrate uh, different versions of the dystrophin sequence. So at the very top of this slide, 
uh, we see different uh, structural domains of the dystrophin protein and the full length protein, which is produced from a 14,000 base pair messenger RNA. Uh, over many years in my laboratory, we've gone through and clipped out different pieces of this dystrophin protein, tested them in a mouse model for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and asked a fairly simple question. Which parts of the dystrophin protein do you need to prevent muscular dystrophy? Which parts can you eliminate? And, and you may say to yourself, well, why would you want to eliminate part of a protein? This is a natural protein. Don't you need the whole thing? Well, for many genes and many proteins, that certainly is the case. But if you recall, we talked earlier about patients with the milder Becker muscular dystrophy. We know from clinical work that there are a number of patients that are missing large parts of the cystrophin protein, yet they have a very mild course of their disease, and that spurred the development of smaller and smaller versions of the dystrophin gene. And where this work has come to today is that we found that we can actually remove very large portions of the middle of the dystrophin protein, and we can remove a fair amount from the very end of the protein, the so-called carboxy-terminal domain of dystrophin, and that leads to what we refer to as a microdystrophin construct that is encoded on a messenger RNA as small as about 3.5 to 4 kb in size. And that gets us into the size range where we can now pack these miniature dystrophin constructs into these AAV shuttle vectors to try to deliver them to muscles. So another way to look at that, this is back to the cartoon we showed you earlier of dystrophin and the dystrophin-associated protein complex. The key parts of the protein that we found that we can delete, as I mentioned earlier, are the CT or the carboxy terminal domain shown on the, the, the left-hand side of this diagram. And then we've also deleted the central part of the domain uh, that encodes many of these so-called spectrum-like repeats. We can delete between approximately repeat four to repeat 23, and that makes for a so-called mini or micro dystrophin, and that's shown here with this animation. We clip out the middle and the end of the protein and instead produce a smaller protein that is still functional because it has the key protein-protein interaction or protein binding domains of the full-size dystrophin. It's still able to assemble this dystrophin-associated protein complex, and it's still able to link the internal cytoskeleton to the extracellular matrix. So a lot of our work has been involved in designing and testing these microdystrophins and asking if they work as well as we might predict. How do you deliver those? I mentioned these AAV shuttle vectors that uh, are showing promise to deliver genes to muscle. What is AAV? AAV is a natural human virus. However, it's never been shown to have any pathogenicity in the clinic. So even though it's been found in, in, in many uh, humans, it has not been linked to any diseases. There are many different uh, types of AAV known as different serotypes. An advantage of this vector is that it's been shown that when you deliver new genes, to a variety of organs in many different species. Uh, it will persist for years at a time, although it will eventually go away. Uh, it's already entered into a variety of human clinical trials for uh, muscle and other tissues, and it has a very safe track record so far. I mentioned earlier it has, it's a small virus, so the delivery shuttles made from this virus are quite small. They don't hold a lot of DNA. They won't hold the full-length dystrophin gene. They won't even hold a full-size dystrophin messenger RNA. But some of these microdystrophins that we've been talking about will fit into these vectors and can be carried. Another important feature about these AAV vectors is that they, when they enter a cell, they exist as a stable episome. And what that means is that they don't integrate or merge into the chromosomes or the DNA of the cell that you're delivering these vehicles to. Uh, that has advantages and disadvantages. By not integrating into a host chromosome, you don't have to worry about disrupting another gene. Uh, but at the same time, uh, being that this uh, episome you've delivered is not part of a chromosome, if those cells start dividing, you will lose the episome. So that is one of the things that contributes to uh, the, the longevity of AAV gene transfer in cells that are not dividing, it can last for years, but in dividing cells, it can be lost quite quickly. So this slide here illustrates how the AAV vector system is, is put to work. Uh, new AAV delivery shuttles are generated in the laboratory in cell culture 
by taking two different plasmids. One plasmid has your therapeutic gene of interest. In this case, it would be a microdystrophin gene with a, a, a muscle-specific gene regulatory element inserted upstream of it. The second plasmid would have the genes that are responsible for the AAV life cycle. In other words, uh, producing the vector and packing your transgene, your therapeutic gene, into an infectious shell. Again, this is all done in cell culture, typically in human 293 cells that are commonly used in biochemical research, although there's other cell types that can be used. And the idea, as shown on the, uh, the right-hand side of the slide, is that this uh, microdystrophin gene that encodes a very small microdystrophin can be carried into an intact AAV capsid. It can then be purified and then either added to cells or, or introduced into the body to try to transfer genes to the different muscles or, or other organs if you're interested in a different disease. So here's an example of how that works in, in, in real life. This is, uh, again, an illustration. We start with two plasmids that are shown uh, in, with the little circles in the top right there. They're introduced into cells that package up your vector. You purify that, and then examples, early studies that have been done in mice, you introduce these delivery shuttles or these vectors into mice. Uh, typically in mice, you can do that by injecting right into the tail vein, but you can introduce this vector into any artery or vein in the animal that you can easily access. And this is what we see in a mouse model for muscular dystrophy known as the MDX mouse. On the very bottom part of this slide are sections from a variety of different muscle types in the mouse uh, that are stained with an antibody against dystrophin. So this is an immunostaining assay to try to look at the production of dystrophin. In the untreated MDX mouse, we don't see any dystrophin protein accumulating. However, the top panel shows representative sections from mice that have been injected with this AAV shuttle vector that's carrying a microdystrophin gene. And as you can see, all of the muscles that we've looked at are now making high levels of this microdystrophin protein. So again, this is a systemic delivery method. We're going into the vasculature to deliver this vehicle. It passes through the bloodstream of the, of the animal. It apparently leaks out of capillaries and infects the underlying muscle tissue. I should mention that AAV vectors will enter many different tissues, but we have a way of using gene regulatory elements that are only active in muscle tissue, so we only produce this new microdystrophin protein in muscle. Here's an example doing a close-up of, of a single muscle. This is the gastrocnemius muscle, one of the major muscles in the leg. Again, it's a, a section from that muscle from a treated animal stained with antibodies against dystrophin. So it's an immunostain for dystrophin. This is a MDX mouse that does not normally make dystrophin. And in this case, we looked a full year after injection of these AAV vectors. And what we see is that almost every muscle cell in this leg is now making this new dystrophin protein. And the things that we see are that these microdystrophins, even though they're much smaller than the normal dystrophin, are able to effectively halt ongoing muscle wasting. We see an increase in strength of the muscle, although I'll come back to that in a minute. And at least in terms of mice, this therapy appears to last for their lifespan. Uh, mice don't live all that long, two to two and a half years, but the uh, gene delivery method is stable throughout that time. So one of the ways that, that we want to ask is how, how functional are these microdystrophins? We now know that we have a way to deliver new genes throughout the body to target all the different muscles. We can produce this smaller microdystrophin protein in those muscle cells, but are those muscle cells corrected? Are they functioning better than in the dystrophic animal? And, and one of the things we like to look at are is, is the strength of the muscle or its ability to contract and generate force. One of, the, one of the major things that skeletal muscles do is that they do work. Uh, you, you can move your arm back and forth and you're stretching your muscles. Uh, some muscles are getting shorter, some are getting longer. And in doing so, in, in developing force in the muscle, uh, that's, that's the way these muscles can do work and we can measure how much force is being developed in a muscle if we stimulate it to contract and the measurement of that in the laboratory is referred to as the force generating capacity of that muscle. And if we normalize it for the size of the muscle, that's referred to as the specific force. So we will typically go in and measure the specific force generating capacity of different muscles to ask, are they getting stronger? 
And here's an example of, of an experiment. In this case, uh, we injected the AAV vectors that are producing this microdystrophin protein into a mouse model for muscular dystrophy. In, in this case, it's a, a DKO or a double knockout mouse. There's actually two mutations which make for a more severe dystrophy. That makes it a little easier to measure the effect we're having. And in the top panel, we're measuring the specific force generating capacity of the muscles uh, or their strength. In black, we see the level of strength in a wild-type muscle. In blue, we see the level of strength in the dystrophic animal. And in red, we see the treated animals. So we have a very significant uh, increase in strength of these animals after delivering these microdystrophins. But it's important to note that it does not go completely back to normal. So that is a, both a positive development and a bit of a limitation. We, we like to see an increase in strength. Uh, I, I wish that it was a little more, but it's a very significant increase in strength. Now, on the other hand, if we look at the bottom panel of this figure, uh, this is a different assay where we're, ag again, measuring the force that the muscle is able to generate. But rather than just measuring the force in, in a single position of the muscle, we're asking what happens to the ability to generate force when the muscle starts working. And, and the particular workload that we put on these muscles is to stretch it out and make it do lengthening contractions. And that tends to be a, an injury prone protocol. And when muscles get injured from these contractions, they lose their ability to develop force. In other words, they become weaker. And so this bottom panel shows an assay where we're measuring the ability of muscles to withstand these injuries and still maintain strength. And what you can see, the blue line shows the loss of strength or the loss of force after several cycles of these stretches in the muscle. So the dystrophic animals very rapidly become injured and lose their ability to develop force. In contrast, as shown in the black bar and the red bars, are wild type muscles, normal muscles, and muscles that have been treated with a microdystrophin. And through a large range of stretches, we see the ability to withstand this injury. And, and what that means is that the microdystrophins are able to protect muscles from normal injury through exercise mechanisms, and they're able to restore a lot of strength to the muscles, but they're not perfect. They don't bring back full strength. And so we've been interested in trying to modify the structure of these microdystrophin proteins to see if we can come up with more and more effective microdystrophins that will still fit into these AAV vectors. And I won't take you through the details, but this is an example of testing a variety of different versions of these microdystrophin proteins in these mouse models for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And in this case, we've treated the mice with these AAV vectors encoding different types of microdystrophin. And we waited six months and asked how effective are they. And there's a variety of assays we can use. Shown here, we're looking at what percentage of the muscle cells are making this protein. And by waiting six months to do this, that gives us an idea of the stability of this protein. We don't want a protein that works really well for a few weeks and then goes away. We want something that can persist for a very long period of time. And the black bars show uh, how well these proteins are able to persist. So some of the different versions of microdystrophin that we've made work better than others. And in particular, the one that circled with the red line, the microdystrophin 2, uh, didn't work so well in terms of how many muscle cells we could get to stably produce this microdystrophin protein. The other thing we can look at is how many of these muscle cells have uh, basically look normal under a microscope. And, and one of the things that we look for with muscle is where are the muscle nuclei. Uh, in normal healthy muscle, the nuclei within a muscle cell are right at the edge of the cell. But in muscular dystrophy, often those nuclei are found in the center of the muscle. So that becomes an easy assay. We can ask, are the nuclei in the right position, or are they in the position that we typically see in the disease? And, and that data is shown here with the red bars, where in this case, we want to see as small of red bar as possible. We don't want to see uh, muscle cells that have the so-called centrally nucleated fibers, or CNF. We want, we want to see those nuclei on the periphery. And again, different microdystrophins have different features. The, the important thing to take out of the slide is, 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 is that the wild type level is normal mice all the way over on the other side of the slide. It says MDX4CV. Those are our untreated dystrophic animals. So those are the two extremes. And we're looking at 
at, at different microdystrophins that will bridge the gap between those two. Uh, the last slide I showed you was with one of the limb muscles. We also like to look at the diaphragm. The diaphragm muscle is the major breathing muscle in, in humans, and it's the muscle that is most severely affected in the disease. So we not only compare how well these microdystrophins work in the limbs, but also in the breathing muscles. And again, some of these different microdystrophins work better than others, but we've come up with a few that seem to work particularly well that we're moving forward with. And here's another example of a type of assay. Uh, we talked about specific force generation in the muscles, an indication of the strength of the muscles. Uh, this is just a panel looking at uh, different uh, microdystrophins uh, and comparing them again to the wild type animals, the MDX animals, which is the mouse model for Duchenne, and different microdystrophins have different abilities to develop strength. This is in the gastrocnemius, so again, the, the lower leg muscle. And we can also look at the diaphragm. And if you uh, notice between these two slides, in particular with the force generating capacity of these two different muscles, one of these constructs that is referred to here as the microdystrophin 5 seems to be performing better than the others, and that's currently our lead candidate that we're moving forward with. The other question that we ask is, even if we have a microdystrophin that we feel pretty good about, which we now do, how are you going to deliver it to the muscles? I mentioned that we're trying to harness these AAV shuttle vectors, but I also mentioned that there's many different serotypes of AAV. So which one is the best one for delivering to the muscles that you need to target in muscular dystrophy? At present, we don't really know the answer to that. We do know that there are several types of AAV that have shown great promise in delivering genes to muscles of a variety of animals. There's been a variety of tests in mice and in, in uh, larger animals as well. Uh, and this is just an example of how those types of comparisons can be performed. In this case, we chose a particular muscle, uh, the TA muscle or the tibialis anterior muscle. We take an AAV vector that is encoding a protein that's very easy to see, to visualize in these muscle sections. We inject it in there, we wait a period of time, and then we stain or assay for the protein we're delivering and we can bring this in at different doses. And so what you can see here in the top panel, we've used a AAV delivery shuttle made from the serotype six vector. And when we inject uh, one times 10 to the 10th particles of this vector, we see pretty good distribution of, of, of the vehicle. But when we go up tenfold to one times 10 to the 11th, we can almost saturate this muscle with the vector. If we simply switch over to a vector a, or a delivery shuttle made from AAV serotype 9, at least in mice, uh, we see significantly less gene transfer with the AAV 9 compared to AAV 6. But I should point out, this is just one example. This is one type of muscle. This is a skeletal muscle. It's not cardiac muscle. It's not smooth muscle. And this is uh, looking at mice. Similar studies have been done in a variety of different animal models. And when you go to larger animal models, there turn out to be some advantages of the AAV9 vector over the AAV6 vector. So the real important question is which one is going to be the best, best of these vectors to use in patients to try to do gene therapy. At this point, we don't know the answer to that question, but we have to base the decisions on what has been seen so far in the different animal models and, and come up with the best guess to go into clinical trials. Uh, speaking of larger animal models, we want to make sure that these genetic therapies that are being developed will work in more than just a mouse. There's been a lot of drugs developed for different diseases that have been perfected in mice that don't necessarily work that well in the clinic. So we are now testing these genetic therapies in a variety of different animals. This is an example of the looking at the canine model for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, there's a naturally occurring uh, dog model that it gets a very serious disease just like humans have. And we've been able to show that these AAV vectors uh, that produce this microdystrophin protein can also be delivered to muscles in the dog and that they have a protective effect. And the example shown on this slide here, particularly in the center panel where we're looking at dystrophin production, shows that nearly two years after administration of a single dose of these AAV vectors, we're still able to produce able to produce high levels of this microdystrophin protein. And this protein is showing uh, uh, a lot of functionality in terms of halting the, the progression of muscular dystrophy in these animals. 
So just to summarize, uh, hopefully I've convinced you that new dystrophin genes can be delivered to the hearts, the limbs, the breathing muscles of adult dystrophic animals. Uh, this approach has shown to be safe and highly effective in mice. It leads to uh, a very significant impact on the disorder in terms of stopping the progression of dystrophy and restoring uh, strength to the animals. Uh, and we have very encouraging early data on uh, applying these methods to larger animals, not only the dogs, but also to uh, uh, some monkey models as well. There's still some remaining challenges that we're looking at before these types of approaches uh, uh, would be successful in the clinic. Uh, you may have noticed that I, I haven't said much about smooth muscle. Uh, we don't know how well these AAV vectors are at entering smooth muscle. Uh, we don't know much about the central nervous system involvement of this disorder. Do the AAV vectors go into the central nervous system? And if so, are they able to correct some of the problems there? In the, in the animal models, we're really just focusing in on the muscle weakness, which of course is the cause of death of the patients. Uh, there are different ways to make these microdystrophin proteins. We're still trying to find the best one. We, we have some that we think work pretty well, uh, but if we can get some that will develop even better force or better strength, that would be an advantage. Uh, we still need to do work on safety and scale up and, uh, <clears throat> and other aspects of this approach to see is it gonna really work and, uh, and hopefully this method can be taken into human clinical trials, which we would like to do as, as soon as possible. So let me move on and talk about a different approach to therapy, and that's this method that I referred to earlier, and, and you'll be hearing about elsewhere in this course, which is to try to trick the muscle cell into ignoring a mutation. And one of the ways that this can be done is a method known as transcript modification using antisense oligonucleotides. And again, this is a different version of the cartoon that I showed you earlier, but if you recall, normally you have a, a wild-type dystrophin gene broken up into exon and introns, and the cellular machinery copies those uh, exons into a messenger RNA that is then uh, used to produce the full-length protein. But on the, over on the other side of the slide, if you have a mutation in one of those exons, in this case denoted by the blue coloring, that can affect uh, the processing of the RNA that comes off of this gene and often that will lead to production of a truncated protein that doesn't have the carboxy terminal domains that are important for localizing the dystrophin complex and that produces a non-functional protein. But if you only have a portion of the gene that has a mutation, if you could skip that part of the gene, much like we were talking about earlier and trying to make miniature dystrophins that are missing the middle part of the gene, well, what if you could just skip over that part of the gene naturally in muscle cells? Uh, maybe you could produce a miniature dystrophin, a mini or a micro dystrophin, naturally without having to bring in a, a vector derived from a virus. And that's the idea behind using antisense oligonucleotides, where you can have a short piece of uh, DNA or sometimes RNA that will anneal with the RNA copy coming off the gene, in this case shown in panel C, as a yellow uh, ASO or antisense oligonucleotide. Uh, those short pieces of DNA when introduced into muscle cells can block inclusion of a particular exon in the final transcript and therefore the cellular machinery will skip over that mutation and now you can make essentially a full-size protein that is only missing a small piece around the mutation. And that's an approach that has shown a lot of promise. It's also an approach that has been adapted to these AAV delivery vehicles that I was talking about earlier. And I'll just show you a few examples from this slide here. If we focus on the bottom part of the panel first, uh, in red is shown uh, a dye uptake, which gives you an illustration of in untreated muscle uh, the regions that are damaged at the, at the moment that you're looking at the muscle. And, and that particular muscle in panel B has also been immunostained with an antibody against dystrophin. You don't see any dystrophin. This is a mouse model for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. But after delivering an AAV vector that in, in this case is not encoding a microdystrophin, but is encoding just a short antisense oligonucleotide, over time that will lead to production of more and more of a essentially a mini dystrophin that is missing the mutant part of the gene. And the top panel shown in A is just a different way of showing traces that are able to measure the strength of the muscle 
black is wild type, red is the mutant animal, and uh, in the MDX mouse, the red line is much lower. It doesn't develop the strength that the wild type animals do, but after delivering these antisense oligonucleotides with an AAV vector, you can restore a significant amount of the strength to the treated muscles. Now, another way to use this antisense oligonucleotide technology is to just deliver these antisense oligonucleotides all by themselves. You don't necessarily need an AAV vector to deliver the machinery to produce these antisense oligos. Uh, you can give those directly to a patient and, and different types of chemistries of antisense oligonucleotides. Some will spread over the body, some will enter muscle cells, and, and some will be more effective than others. So there's been a lot of interest in uh, using different uh, types of DNA or RNA or DNA-RNA hybrid sequences to deliver antisense oligonucleotides. One of the more interesting chemistries that's been developed is known as a morpholino antisense oligonucleotide. Morpholinos have a variety of advantages. They, uh, they have a, a long-term stability. Uh, they're able to be injected intravenously and they're, they're, they're quite stable, and they show a higher affinity for binding to the RNA transcript that's coming off a gene and might be more effective at uh, leading to this, this uh, gene skipping phenomena. This just gives you an idea of the difference in chemistries uh, between the most commonly used antisense oligonucleotides. I, I wouldn't expect anyone uh, listening to this lecture to memorize these structures, but if you want to go through it a little bit on the on what's shown is the normal structure of RNA or ribonucleic acid where you have a, a, a nucleoside base bound to a ribose ring. Uh, the most common type of antisense oligonucleotide simply has a modification of the ribose ring where there's a methyl group introduced in place of a, of a, of a hydrogen. And then the morpholino chemistry that I referred to a moment ago is shown on the right where the ribose ring is ostensibly modified to make a, a morpholine ring. And, and that can be modified in a variety of other ways in order to increase the ability of these uh, uh, oligonucleotides to enter muscle cells and display stability. And, and here's an example uh, that involves direct delivery of an antisense oligonucleotide, again, to the mouse model of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This is not using the AAV vector that I showed you earlier. This is a, a direct injection of these purified oligonucleotides and we see a similar outcome where the muscles, uh, in this case we're looking at the strophin that is shown in red, uh, are able to produce a, an essentially normal dystrophin after delivery of these antisense oligonucleotides. Panel B shows an immunoblot where we're able to see production of an essentially full-size protein in a variety of muscle types. And panel C uh, looks at uh, the amount of uh, a protein that's produced in, 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 in a variety of different muscles. So this is a very promising approach. It's, it appears to be effective and it's a lot simpler than some of the viral vector methods. So this is another approach that's moving into the clinic. This slide here is, is just another example of that. Panel D is looking at the strength of the muscles. Again, red is the treated muscles. Uh, it's getting close to the normal level, but it's not quite up there all the way. And uh, panel E just shows uh, uh, another assay for muscle function, in this case we're looking at the leakage of enzymes out of muscle into the bloodstream, and the amount of leakage uh, is, is significantly lower in the treated animals than in the non-treated animals. So what I've hopefully shown you today is that uh, there's a variety of gene therapy approaches for the muscular dystrophies. I've emphasized Duchenne muscular dystrophies. I'd, I'd like to mention that these general approaches can probably be applied to many of the other different types of muscular dystrophy. But what we know so far is that both dystrophin replacement and transcript modification are showing a lot of promise for a leading to a functional correction of Duchenne muscular dystrophy by allowing for uh, increased production of a, either a normal or a highly functional version of the dystrophin protein. Uh, methods to do this are actively being developed in a variety of laboratories and they're being prepared for clinical trials and some of these approaches are already in clinical trials particularly the ASO or the antisense oligonucleotide approaches are currently being tested in the clinic. The gene therapy methods per se are, are moving rapidly towards clinical application. And again, if they work successfully, then I think we're going to see them being applied to many other forms of muscular dystrophy. 
So I'm going to stop right there. I thank you all for listening. I hope you learned a little bit about gene therapy and uh, uh, we'll see how, how well this works and keep moving it forward. Thank you.